From Washington to Warsaw, Paris to Ankara, Brussels, Berlin, Bucharest, and Belgrade. Through pandemics and political movements, cooperation and confrontation, digital divides, and defending democracy. The German Marshall Fund is at the pulse of transatlantic relations today, convening the experts and insights needed to navigate tomorrow's world. A warm welcome to all of you to this event about Weimar at 30. How can France, Germany, and Poland revitalize transatlantic relations? We want to use the opportunity of the 30th anniversary of this trilateral cooperation among these three countries to discuss whether their cooperation can in turn give new energy to the transatlantic agenda. I am Karen Donfried, president of GMF, and I am thrilled that the ambassadors of Poland, Germany, and France are with us to share their views. You have their full bios, and I know you want to hear from them, not about them. So let me say just two things about three of Europe's most accomplished diplomats. First, when I hear the word endurance, I think of these three. Ambassador Vilcek passed his first endurance test by becoming a tenured professor at the University of Warsaw. And he has earned a second endurance medal here in Washington, as he has the longest tenure here of our three ambassadors. Ambassador Haber, before stepping into her current role, served as state secretary in the German interior ministry at a time when the two areas she was responsible for, homeland security and migration policy, were experiencing major crises simultaneously. She passed that endurance test with grace and determination. Ambassador Etienne began his posting in Washington in 2019, but he wasn't able to immediately leave behind his old job as President Macron's diplomatic advisor because he was seen as indispensable to the success of France's G7 presidency and was in charge of the G7 summit. So he did this amazing juggling act as he tried to settle in here in Washington, thus also earning an endurance medal. My second comment about these three distinguished ambassadors is that they are not only indefatigable public servants, but they are also unusually creative in their diplomacy and they are intellectually nimble. That is the attribute all of you will be wowed by today. Thank you so much, Ambassadors Vilcek, Haba, and Etienne. It is a true pleasure to have you. There is no better person to moderate this conversation than Julia de Klerk Saxe, who is leading the Weimar Triangle Project here at GMF. So with that, Julia, over to you. Thank you so much, Karen, for this wonderful introduction and I must say I'm um, I'm thrilled what better panel than uh, people who show endurance and nimbleness in the face of uh, the multiple global challenges we're facing and um, so thanks thanks for this Karen and and a, a big bonjour uh, dobre, and, and hello also from my side um, it's really thrilling to to have you all here um, and um, as Karen already referred to, the purpose of our discussion is really twofold today. It's to look at uh, how to revitalize the transatlantic relationship um, after a period of, of turbulence and um, also specifically look how, how three countries, uh, France, Germany and Poland, can help um, revitalize that relationship, can help build um, a coordinated European um, contribution to the transatlantic relationship. Um, 
as Karen already referred to, there's a, this, this is in a way an opening event for a series of events that we're um, organizing at GMF to mark the 30th anniversary of the, the Weimar Triangle, um, which for those of you who are, who are not so familiar with that, this foreign policy format and, and the history of it, indeed celebrates its, its 30th anniversary this year uh, and was really a, a sort of invented in order to bring Poland into the fold of, of the West and, and strengthen European cooperation on a, on a number of issues after the fall uh, of the Berlin Wall. And um, in many ways we think is, is particularly relevant today, again, in, in very new ways to, to bring a new dynamic to, to European foreign policy and, and to transatlantic relations. So we very much look forward um, to having the three of you discuss this. Now, um, we have one hour, three speakers, and a whole panoply of issues to discuss today. Uh, we also have a very impressive turnout of participants with us, uh, and, and I'm thrilled um, to have you all there. And even though we can't unfortunately still be in the same room, I'd like to make this discussion as inclusive as we can. So for those of you in the audience who would like to pose a question, to our panelists, um, please use the Q&A function so we can make sure that we work uh, those questions into our conversation. Now, there's a lot of positive momentum behind the transatlantic relationship. I think after a period of, of turbulence, we were all keen to, to, to restart afresh. And um, we've seen this from, from both sides. Uh, at the very outset of the Biden administration's Europeans have put proactively an agenda of issues uh, on, on the table that, that really outlines how they see the cooperation with uh, the new administration and of course uh, President Biden very early on made overtures to, to Europe by giving his address at the Munich Security Conference and we've just had this followed up by Secretary Blinken's visit to, to Brussels. Um, at the same time though we see as, as in any relationship I would say who's starting to you know uh, refresh uh, after a, a period of turbulence there's if you will, a sort of lingering apprehension as well on, on both sides. Um, some voices in Europe are asking, can we still trust the Americans? Um, others in, in the United States are saying, now that we're back at the table, we're ready to pick up the pieces, where is Europe? Um, at the same time, the global challenges that we're faced with aren't getting smaller. There's really no time for us to sort of regroup and navel gaze about, you know, how are we going to do this? Uh, the challenges are there. They're really requiring uh, rapid action. So the, the challenge for, for both sides is really to sort of restart its relationship um, and immediately sort of get into to active mode as well. And it's really wonderful to have um, our three panelists here. And I'd, I'd like to uh, really start with Ambassador Vilcek, um, if I can, to, to hear from, from you, um, how, does, how does Poland approach the new Biden administration? Uh, what are your priorities for, for the corporation, given the breadth of issues that there are, and as I said, the sort of urgency uh, in the face of numerous challenges? And how do you think that cooperation with your partners in, in France and Germany uh, will help you advance this, this agenda. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for this opportunity to discuss uh, how Poland, along with France and Germany, can contribute to revitalizing transatlantic relations. Uh, I would like to thank uh, GMF for organizing the event. I'm happy to share my thoughts together with my distinguished colleagues, Ambassador Haber and Ambassador Etienne. Uh, as you've already mentioned, this year marks uh, the 30th anniversary of Weimar Triangle. And I should say that the cooperation between France and Germany on the one hand, and with the United States on the other, was a historic and strategic choice made by Poland after the fall of communism 30 years ago. For the last 30 years, uh, Poland has been very consistent with its primary goal, which was, as you've also already mentioned, a full return to the European and transatlantic communities. 
uh, including membership in the European Union and, and NATO. So Germany, France, and the United States were very helpful in this process. And I think that the Weimar Triangle, the Weimar format was also very helpful at that time in 99 and 2004. Uh, Poland uh, has had excellent relations with all US administrations, including, uh, including the Obama and Trump administrations. So what we do hope is just to develop our historically strong Polish-American ties under the Biden presidency and make further progress uh, on both bilateral and multilateral issues, such as uh, strengthening NATO's eastern flank, uh, US support for EU energy security, and also maintaining, uh, maintaining um, I would say, a resolute policy toward Russia. We would like to build upon the achievements made so far and to maintain this relationship, relationship uh, multidimensional. Uh, we have, of course, new, new challenges uh, related to the COVID pandemic and to, um, to various other issues. Uh, so again, uh, our, our priorities are enhancing cooperation within NATO, and I think we can do it both with France and Germany and the United States, uh, strengthening ties between the European Union and the United States. Uh, I think that a joint EU-US agenda should be ambitious, should be focused on global challenges, including economic recovery after the pandemic, climate change, trade, managing regional conflicts, promoting democracy, and facing challenges like China and Russia together, together the European Union and the United States. And also, um, also uh, uh, I should say that uh, our, our, um, our priority is uh, cooperation in uh, international fora. We welcome America's declaration uh, to return to the Paris Climate Agreement, the World Health Organization, the UN Human Rights Council. And we believe that also in these organizations, uh, the European Union countries, including France, Germany, and Poland can work together with, uh, with uh, the United States. So in general, um, I think this is a very optimistic perspective and the role of, of the, the Weimar Triangle is just to work together within the European Union to strengthen this relationship in, in new circumstances. But I also would like to emphasize that for Poland, it's just a continuation of very good relationship with, with all previous administrations since 1989. Um, so we don't think about this change as a great breakthrough moment, but just uh, an opportunity to, to cooperate maybe more fully also in this uh, multilateral dimension, which was not, uh, which was not uh, so much present in the last few years. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Haber, if I can turn um, to you now. now uh, Germany is traditionally, of course, a, a fervent supporter of a transatlantic, a strong transatlantic bond. We are, after all, speaking here today at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. That was a recognition, really, of the um, great investment that Americans made into rebuilding Germany and, and the rest of Europe. And I think that is something that is still very deeply anchored in the, the political consciousness of, of the country and certainly its foreign policy elite, if you will. Um, so I think for Germany, it was a particular shock to, to just sort of see a, a, a much more turbulent in, in parts adversarial uh, relationship uh, in past years. And I think there is, is now a lot of hope and optimism to, um, to work together on, on really a, a number of things. At the same time, we also see that the world has changed and challenges that we're confronting together uh, have changed. So uh, Foreign Minister Maas has, has sort of spoken about a, a new beginning or a, a new deal, if you will. So I'd, I'd like to hear from you 
what does that look like? Uh, I mean, also maybe responding to, to Ambassador Vilcek, where do you see the priorities? Uh, how can we work together both across the Atlantic and amongst uh, these three European partners to, uh, to get to positive results? You're still mute. I'm sorry about that. I, I really uh, battled uh, with technology right now, which I shouldn't be doing after one year of Zoom. What I was saying is thank you for um, the invitation, uh, uh, Karen Donfried. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, also to you, uh, uh, Julia de Klerk. Uh, and let me react to both what you said and uh, what my very good friend Piotr said. Yes, it's true. Uh, Germans might uh, be inclined to uh, um, state uh, a trifle stronger the element of change uh, that comes with the present administration. We've been uh, um, in the focus of uh, some of major, or not disagreements, but uh, uh, disputes uh, over the past years. And uh, the new administration certainly uh, uh, uses a different uh, tonality, the atmosphere, the style is different, and certainly the uh, um, the view and perception of the European Union uh, and of alliances uh, is a different one, uh, which um, uh, if, if, there is a major difference if you see the world as an arena where everyone is vying uh, for, um, for uh, influence, interests uh, and advantages, or whether you see the world uh, uh, as an arena where you cooperate with allies and those aligned and partners and like-minded in order to um, uh, achieve uh, shared objectives. But it's still very early days. Whenever I talk to colleagues from the administration right now uh, on concrete issues, uh, people would say um, there's a review process going on. And yes, it's true, uh, as Piotr pointed out, uh, um, there has been a cascade of foreign policy decisions uh, 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 from the uh, WHO, uh, returning to the climate agreement, uh, uh, UNRWA, and so forth. Uh, but the fact is, uh, the fact remains that on many issues, uh, uh, a review process is going on. And here's where I would say uh, the, um, the mechanism of the Weimar triangle, uh, triangle comes in. As Piotr and both you uh, have said, uh, the Weimar Triangle, uh, when founded 30 years ago, uh, rested basically on two pillars. One pillar uh, was uh, ending the division of uh, the European continent. It wasn't only about Poland, it was about Eastern European uh, uh, countries. It was about achieving, uh, um, or, uh, uh, achieving not only unity, but also ending uh, the tragic division uh, uh, of, uh, of the European continent. And over time, uh, uh, this, um, uh, this objective uh, changed when uh, Poland and Eastern European countries uh, joined uh, the European Union, the Weimar Triangle became, uh, I'd call it an, an engine, because let's point this out, we are very different countries. We're proud sovereign nations, we're proud members of the European Union. Uh, but we have different uh, vantage points, uh, different experiences, different histories. But this is just what is so important uh, because um, uh, as we on certain issues will be pulling uh, into different direction in order to achieve cohesion and unity in Europe, which is our shared objective, then it's so important uh, that countries like ours sit together in order to figure out uh, what our interests are, our constraints are, uh, and what the way forward might be. 
And that applies to the transatlantic relationship as well. The founding document of the uh, Fama Triangle says that transatlantic security and stability is crucial uh, uh, for our countries. And that has remained the case uh, ever since. That uh, has not changed. The challenges uh, uh, or the threats uh, that confront us uh, may have changed, uh, but the relevance uh, and the resilience of transatlantic uh, uh, um, relations uh, for the stability uh, uh, of the transatlantic realm, that hasn't changed. And here is uh, where we might see the Weimar Triangle also uh, work as, a, um, as an engine in the transatlantic uh, relationship as the reviews uh, uh, um, uh, continue. Um, when we try to sort out uh, in which directions to move, uh, then it will help us sorting out uh, within the transatlantic relationship and with our American uh, partners on how to move forward. Because that's simply a truth. We always talk about unity and cohesion. And yes, that's important. But diplomacy is actually about managing and overcoming uh, uh, differences and actually preventing uh, developments uh, that go uh, uh, downhill. So that's what we need to do. And that's why the Weimar Triangle, both in the European pillar and the transatlantic pillar, uh, has a role to play today. Thank you so much, Ambassador Haber, and also for setting the, the broader context of how Weimar can, can really, the Weimar format can, can contribute um, and, um, and the importance of both working together as well as managing division, something we, we may come back to uh, later in, in this debate. Ambassador Tian, if I can um, turn to you now. Uh, we've already heard from two of your colleagues um, on the sort of renewed dynamism in, in transatlantic relations on, on the agenda that's there. One of the things that France has been um, a leading force in and a leading partner in the European context is during the times of, of greater turbulence to also push for something which has been necessary and, and important for a while, but which really came to the fore um, during the past years, a sort of more a stronger uh, and proactive European approach to foreign policy and um, taking care of its own security and defense and defining really its own, own interests um, and um, taking, taking leadership, taking leadership in its own neighborhood, uh, uh, taking leadership for its own uh, security and that of its citizens. This is something that President Macron has uh, has really emphasized over and again. Um, and I just wonder, I mean, with the with the new administration now in place and America back at the table willing to lead, how do we, what is your assessment? I mean, are, are Europeans, do they risk leaning back now? And, and sort of being less ambitious, or how do we keep this momentum also for greater European ambition um, to be proactive on foreign policy uh, as something that can contribute to, to a more dynamic transatlantic partnership? And how, how do you see what can France do to keep this momentum? Well, <laughs> first, <laughs> thank you very much, Karen and, and Julia. And thank you, uh, GMF, German Marshall Fund, for uh, <laughs> giving a visibility here in the US to the uh, Weimar Triangle, to this format. Uh, it's very important for, that we, we uh, this format uh, uh, get some uh, visibility here in the United States <laughs> for the reasons which Piotr and, uh, and, uh, and Emily have uh, very well explained. I completely uh, adhere to what they said. And um, for me, it's a bit personal because uh, first, uh, I have a, a personal friendship both to Emily and to Piotr since I arrived here. I have a personal history in Germany where I was ambassador, but also a personal history in Poland where I traveled quite uh, young as a young student. And uh, also I was in Weimar uh, for the 25th anniversary uh, of uh, the creation of this uh, format in uh, 1991. And it's very symbolic for me, not only of course, uh, the history of this format, what it meant, what it meant after, as you recall, Julia, in your introduction, the fall of the Berlin Wall, but also the, the the fact it is in Weimar, which is a, a, a symbolic place uh, for all sorts of historic reasons that uh, all of us we know. 
And I remember this meeting in Weimar and my visits uh, to, to Weimar. And uh, I think it is very, very important for Europe, but also for the transatlantic uh, relation to uh, realize that the three countries, uh, I mean, Poland, Germany, and France, we want to uh, uh, not only uh, to uh, to recall that we have created this format 30 years ago, but now nowadays also to use it both, as Emily said, internally in the European Union, because we are different countries and we, we have a high potential when we agree on these issues, which are the most important to, to, to make things moving in the right direction, but also with the United States and in the transatlantic framework. Now, coming to your question, of course, uh, we are very very, very reassured by the renewed, strongly renewed US commitment to the alliance. You remember, you, you recalled the visit uh, uh, to into Europe by Tony Blinken. I also see a, a very good sign in the fact that President Biden wanted to address the European summit, uh, to, to talk to the European leaders at their last summit. And uh, in this respect, you, you, you mentioned, and uh, it was also mentioned by my colleagues that things obviously are better. We see very, very important decisions taken by the US administration. Piotr uh, re reminded us of some of them. Uh, but of course, things have moved and everybody says that. And you, you, you said, Julia, uh, there is this question, uh, where is Europe now from the, the American side? Uh, and indeed, Europe has been moving like the world. Uh, and. Uh, we, we will talk about uh, the rise of the Chinese uh, influence in the world and many things are happening. And so what you, what you said about France, I don't think it's only about France, by the way, but I don't, I, I will not speak for other countries, but we see in Europe that uh, we have to um, really to build up an, a double agenda, both of sovereignty, but also of responsibility for the Europeans. Uh, our leaders collectively as European Union have uh, a bit like what the new administration says rightly, we have to take into account the interests of our middle class, of our working class, and to defend the interests of our people. And we will be stronger, of course, um, uh, as democracies, if we, we show to our people that we take their interests and our values into account. Obviously, this uh, uh, agenda of uh, what we call European sovereignty, which is really necessary when you see the world as it has been moving in the last years, is also in the interest for me of, the, of, of our strongest and uh, most important ally, which is the United States, because the United States needs, and I think it was really said, uh, I have a quotation by uh, what, what uh, Tony Blinken said in, uh, in his uh, speech when he was in Brussels, he said, stronger allies make for stronger alliances. This is really the point. Uh, to have a stronger European ally is also very important for the United States, which whatever administration, Democrat, Democratic, uh, Republican has all in the last years constantly asked for the Europeans for being uh, taking a, a more a greater share in the in the burden in the common burden especially in security matters but it's not only about security and so the question where is Europe has been answered already to a large extent also by the European Union which uh, already in December the European institutions have uh, you I think you you mentioned it uh, Julia in your introduction has proposed quite an edge an ambitious agenda to the new administration and uh, by the leaders of the European Union uh, as I said when they <laughs> they met uh, last time and the way they met with President Biden thank you so much ambassador and for also um, filling in that that dimension of the transatlantic uh, partnership and indeed the, the European cooperation that sort of sustains it. Um, Ambassador Haber, you, you said, and if I can pick you up on that, um, that, that this format and, and also transatlantic relations are about uh, a common agenda and working together, um, but also sort of managing differences. Um, and I, I'd like to pick up on a couple of issues where we actually have to do both, I think. So where there is uh, a clear sort of common priority to address them, but maybe also different ways to get at them, both across the Atlantic and, um, and also amongst uh, the three countries that we have here today. Um, 
and I'd like to start with, with China, which obviously looms large. Um, and in many ways, I think if you look at US uh, policy and US foreign policy is really the prism through which America views the world now. If we're looking at what's changed uh, in, in the past years, I think that is really one major development that, that we're seeing. China has been on the rise for a long time, but it, is, it has really become the overall sort of focusing and anchoring point um, of um, America's policies. In one hand, looking at the geostrategic competition in the world between the United States and, and China, but also uh, if you listen both to President Biden, but also uh, Tony Blinken during his visit, a sort of confrontation of systems. And um, uh, the framing that we have in the United States is really one of sort of democracies versus autocracies. Uh, more so than sort of the multilateral cooperation that, that Europeans uh, talk a, a lot about. And um, Europeans have, have moved a lot in their assessment on China. Traditionally, they've looked at China as mostly as, a, as an economic partner. Germany certainly has made a huge leaps in terms of how it views China. Um, but at the same time, it's... it's uh, it doesn't look at China quite the same way in the way that, that the US uh, sees it and, and the sort of common European uh, strategy that has come out has a sort of threefold definition looking at it uh, as, a, as a strategic challenge in the same way as the United States and economic competitor or competitor in certain spheres, but also as a partner. And, and uh, Europeans have also um, been strong in sort of stressing that role. Now, I, I wonder during the, the pandemic, so just over the past year, we've seen a, a real change also in Europe and sort of China's influence in terms of mask diplomacy, now vaccine diplomacy, strategic communications, uh, interference, uh, things that we've been sort of more used to maybe on the sides of, of Russia, less so from, from China. Um, so that the policy had, has become more adversarial uh, also in the geopolitical sphere, not just in its own sphere of influence, if you will, but, but really um, in Europe as well. Um, and now with the sort of recent tit for tat on, on sanctions, uh, some people see that there's, there's been a, a departure on Europe's, or this is, may ring in and sort of new positioning on China from Europe. So could you could you comment on that? Are, are Europeans uh, shifting their position towards a more confrontational approach with China? Is it getting closer to, to the United States uh, view? Or, or where, where, do, where do Europeans stand? Where are they on China at this moment? Well, I think you captured uh, the dynamic aspect uh, of the evolution of European positions very well. Um, but let me say this at the outset. Um, while we agree on the fundamentals, and that is uh, the um, um, race of our time will be uh, um, in the arena of technology. Uh, and uh, there is actually a race between tech democracies and tech uh, uh, autocracies. And whether democracies prevail or stand their ground, uh, in technology and in this race will have a huge impact uh, on uh, our, the capacities of uh, our democracy. Because after all, uh, um, the standards and the space and the limits and the constraints for these frontier technologies will have a huge impact uh, on our democracies and our, on our capacity to defend democrat democratic rights. So that's what's, what's essential. But looking beyond that, I think it's a given uh, that we all will have different prisms uh, while looking at China, and that's normal. Japan, Japan will look uh, will have a different vantage points given uh, uh, proximity and uh, geography and history and experience. Uh, Europeans uh, will have different uh, vantage points. The United States uh, will have their uh, vantage point. And you know, uh, all of them are um, legitimate and normal. That's, it happens, you can never mirror completely a, a, a relationship and certainly not of a, um, a relationship with a country. Uh, um, uh, so, so large, so big, so powerful as uh, as China, uh, 
which uh, is uh, on the verge of of, a of of being the strongest economy in the world and has shown us, as you pointed out during the pandemic, uh, uh, its a determination uh, uh, to uh, use a, a very muscular uh, wolf warrior uh, diplomacy and going actually beyond uh, violating uh, international right think of Hong Kong, think of the Uyghurs. So we are in a different story than we were uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you uh, mentioned the threefold, the three-pronged approach uh, of the European Union rival uh, competitor uh, uh, and uh, someone we have to deal with because the big issues where China is simply too relevant to ignore. Uh, namely pandemic or uh, climate change and so forth. So diplomacy with regard to China uh, will be complex, it's true. Uh, um, we'll just have to uh, figure out how to factor in the, uh, the uh, different vantage points and interests because our shared objective is uh, to be uh, as strong as we possibly can collectively. But not every di difference uh, needs to be subject to a loyalty test. Uh, I'm saying that because I'm appealing to all of us to see uh, that diplomacy is actually about, uh, uh, well, seeking common ground, uh, establishing, expanding a common ground, managing differences, and trying to overcome them. And that's what we should do among uh, ourselves uh, without, um, uh, without, uh, uh, um, uh, trying to take every uh, legitimacy uh, of uh, uh, certain steps uh, uh, that uh, that will not mirror one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one, uh, uh, the policy of the other. Now, you haven't mentioned the CAI, but I think it's a good case in point. Uh, it was a minor sectoral agreement that had been negotiated for, uh, uh, for over seven uh, years. Uh, it um, uh, copied some of the elements uh, of the uh, American uh, agreement. It established uh, um, uh, uh, it established advantages that uh, the United States will also profit from uh, on the basis of the uh, uh, of the uh, most favored na nation principle. So it's a stepping stone. It's not a, um, a decision to hedge or to move in a different direction. It's just part and parcel. Uh, of a, a greater effort uh, to establish a, a level playing field uh, and doing that uh, alongside with as many uh, partners uh, as we possibly uh, can. And I would contend uh, that seeing, the, uh, um, uh, uh, seeing China through the prism of the three-pronged approach is not so far away of how uh, uh, this administration sees us at well. Uh, uh, we'll have to look at the details uh, but again, the objective is uh, let's look at what's really important and what's really important is our capacity to stand our ground uh, and prevail in the technological race of our time. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Ambassador Etienne, if I can turn to you, just picking up on what um, Ambassador Harbour just said, the importance is to stand our ground and to have a, a common position no matter our different vantage points. How strong does that stance need to be and what concretely do we need to do? Ambassador Haber mentioned um, technology. What are other areas where you feel that uh, Europeans and Americans uh, need to work together to, um, to push back against um, China's advances, both uh, in Europe and the sort of geopolitical challenges that it poses? Well, it's a, obviously a very important topic and uh, uh, it's precisely, um, such topics which uh, uh, make necessary for Europe to, to have this uh, agenda I mentioned of uh, both sovereignty and responsibility in the world of today. And uh, I would add to these two concepts uh, when we talk about our relations with China, uh, the two concepts of sovereignty and responsibility, the concept of reciprocity. And we, we have moved, uh, Europe has, been, has moved, has been moving quite a, quite a, a long way in, uh, in, uh, its, in its relations with China, indeed, in the last years. And you, you both of you, uh, Julia and uh, Emily, you mentioned this three-pronged uh, three approach, which has, uh, has been defined. But we have also started, and uh, we were the first country to do it, because we have in, the, in this region some interest and some presence 
uh, but I think Germany also is uh, has been doing that uh, to 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 make positions uh, as uh, also countries interested in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region, which is uh, something obviously very important for for the United States. Um, so uh, as Emily said, we are ob obviously not always in the same positions. Uh, because we are in Europe and uh, we are not in the United States, the US is not Europe, but we share very much um, uh, a number of concerns. And um, technology, uh, you asked me, Julia, what other fields would become uh, covered by these uh, common concerns. But I, let me say that technology, I, I, I agree with uh, Emily that it is absolutely crucial because it, it is at the juncture of economy and democracy. The, what we will, the, the, the possibility for the, the Western democracies, for the democracies, not Western democracies, to set the standards in issues like uh, artificial intelligence are absolutely essential, not only for our competitiveness and for the success, economic success of our democracies, which is in its turn important for the democracies, the future of our democracies itself, but also for directly the future of our democracies, because uh, it covers, as we see uh, with the competition of different models, uh, it covers directly the functioning. It has their direct consequences for the functioning of our democracies. but. There are other issues, of course, uh, human rights, uh, uh, security or freedom of circulation, uh, and um, uh, the uh, fundamental issue of um, uh, level, the level playing field in the in the in the economic in the global economy. This is the reason why we, it is so important that the new U.S. administration again has decided to rejoin the multilateral work together with uh, its European allies. We have to reform the World Trade Organization and we have to re reform it in the sense of our common interest, in the common interest of our economies. Uh, and what uh, uh, Emily said about the comprehensive agreement on investment, which was politically concluded at the end of last year, makes much sense both from the economic point of view and from the uh, point of view of our values, because for the first time uh, in this agreement, China has agreed on provisions concerning, for instance, the fight against forced labor, at least expressing this, uh, its willingness to rejoin the uh, ILO convention on this uh, very important issue. So I think that Europe, with its policies, more, more assert much more assertive than before. Uh, here too, as I said in my first uh, answer, as a good opportunity to show, and is already doing that, is already showing to the US that it's, it, it, it became a stronger ally with uh, our own policies, but with very, very uh, d definitely uh, quite common goals uh, in a number of uh, fundamental areas. Thanks a lot. Maybe if I can just come back to, to, to both of you uh, on one point, given that you mentioned the, the, the um, investment agreement with China earlier this year. Um, which now in the sort of game of, of tit for tat sanctions and, and Chinese have, have sanctioned a lot of parliamentarians who've already been uh, um, critical in the European parliament of, of this agreement. Do you think this agreement will, will survive as the sort of um, uh, situation with China seems to become more and more tense? I cannot make any prediction, uh, but it certainly has made uh, the case hasn't made the case easier in the European Parliament. Uh, and it's true, as you pointed out, uh, uh, that um, uh, China has imposed uh, very heavy sanction, uh, sanctions on uh, on the Europeans, uh, and I think that's not that's little uh, observed in the United States. To what extent? Uh, uh, China has reacted to a very strong voice emanating from Europe on what uh, uh, China has done and where we put a price tag on. So it's actually an area uh, where uh, we worked hand in glove and very closely uh, with the, uh, within the transatlantic uh, uh, um, uh, framework. Well, and on my side, I would just add that obviously 
the last year was a political conclusion. Uh, already at that time, it was clear that we have still to to press to go through uh, formal uh, steps to to get to a formal approval. And obviously, the European Parliament is here a key player on the European side. So uh, the answer is uh, obvious. But um, uh, I am sure we will continue on the European side to work on this. Thanks a lot, Ambassador Wilczek. If you, I can bring you in now, uh, you didn't mention China in your in your opening remarks, and, and geographically, as a security concern, maybe to to sort of uh, a, a lot of Polish people, China has been quite far far away. But I, again, over the past year or so, I think we've seen uh, Chinese influence in in the Balkans. Uh, I already mentioned mass diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy now in in Europe's neighborhood where, where China is um, uh, getting very close and very present in, in Europe's neighborhood and also, of course, interfering in our own um, societies and we've also heard about uh, on a different angle and it's great to see a sort of uh, already a, a common agenda on, on tech and, and china emerging uh, here in the weimar format but um the link between economy and, and, and democracies but maybe also uh, how, how china uses this economic uh, presence and footprint for geostrategic aims and i think again this we've seen uh, uh in areas very close to Poland. So how, how worried are you about this uh, increasing uh, advance of China, which no longer is just an economic one, um, but it was sort of more strategic, uh, geostrategic one, also in the area of strategic communications. And, um, and how do you assess uh, in, in that shifting role, also the, the 17 plus one format of, of which Poland um, has been critical recently, but also is, is a part of? Uh, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, so first of all, I would like to, to emphasize that Poland is trying to develop uh, bilateral relations uh, with China in the framework of uh, the so-called comprehensive strategic partnership. So we, uh, we support an engagement which is at the same time principled and pragmatic, and we are doing this as members of the European Union. And uh, so we attach uh, I would say great attention to the development of mutually beneficial trade cooperation with China. China is our biggest uh, economic partner in Asia and very important partner. And China, as we all know, made an unprecedented progress in recent years in terms of economic development. So um, uh, as regards the 17 plus one format, which you mentioned, uh, Poland, uh, Poland's opinion is that this format I would say empowers the EU's voice uh, in the cooperation with China. So uh, this is um, um, an opportunity for other members, EU member states, who are members of of this um, 17 plus one format, to uh, treat it as an additional channel uh, of highlighting EU objectives. So our position is that it's good to to be a part of this format. Uh, as you may know, our president, uh, Andrzej Duda, quite recently took part in the high level summit of 17 plus one. And uh, the, 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 this format, uh, which includes also non-EU countries is, is very, very important uh, for us. Um, the, uh, the important point of this year's 17 plus one summit agenda was cooperation in the time of, uh, of the coronavirus pandemic and bringing economies back on the development track. So, um, so I think that there are many threats and there are uh, human rights issues which we raise together with our, our EU partners, which were already mentioned by, by Philip. And um, we, of course, uh, the Euro European Union should uh, maintain all constructive actions in the field of human rights protection in China. and. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so China abides uh, by its national and international obligations, but you know, at the same time, we cannot forget about the role of, of China in international economy. So again, I think we have to be principled, but at the same, same time pragmatic. And of course, there will be differences um, between the European Union countries and the United States. 
the debate about the comprehensive agreement on investment is one of the examples. But um, I think that in current circumstances, we uh, should uh, in, in it be in conversation with the United States and work as the European Union, but uh, we cannot ignore such an important uh, trade partner, economic partner, and, and such an important great power. Thanks a lot, um, Ambassador. Now, we're already getting dangerously close to ending time, which is, I think we could probably debate for a few more hours. And I'm, uh, I'd like to turn the conversation to, to Russia. And in doing so, I'll already weave in some of the questions that we've received from, from our audience, just to make sure that, that we also have that perspective um, covered. And I'll, I'll take a few um, more. Now, uh, at this very moment, we're seeing sort of troop movements on uh, Russian troop movements uh, in eastern Ukraine, which uh, both European partners and, and uh, American partners have, have expressed their, their concern and sort of reinstated their, their support for uh, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of, of Ukraine. Um, Russia, again, um, is an issue where uh, transatlantic cooperation is crucial. I think that's <laughs> agreed on, on both sides. It's certainly a challenge, uh, both to, to Europe and, uh, and to transatlantic uh, aims and also its unity. I think Russia has been also keen, just like China, to kind of divide and, and conquer and using a lot of uh, opportunities. Uh, it's also interfered again domestically in our, our democracies. Many of the countries here and also the United States have have seen that um, in action. So um, at the same time, there are different vantage points again for both America and and Europeans. Um, Russia is very close to Europe <laughs> geographically, uh, has a different kind of history. Um, uh, Ambassador Vilcek has already mentioned that uh, it, it's, um, uh, of course, a huge uh, security threat to, um, to, to Europe and, um, and, and very close to, to the borders of at least some of our member states. Um, how do you see the priorities for, for sort of renewed cooperation on, on Russia with, with the United States? President Biden has been quite outspoken uh, on, on Russia and the need to, to push back against it. And um, where do you see sort of uh, the common agenda on Russia in, in the NATO context, but also in the, in the European Union context? Uh, Ambassador Etienne, if I can maybe start with you, because um, I think President Macron has been uh, vocal on both the, the need to, to push back against Russia, but also talked about sort of cooperation or finding a new, new basis and be interesting in view of current developments, how much basis is there so for, for working with Russia uh, cooperatively? The European Union has, has recently been quite uh, visibly rebuffed uh, in its initiatives to, to reach out and to, to have this common, again, a, a two-throng approach, if you will, uh, of cooperation and, and uh, firm sanctions um, pushing back against Russia. Where do you see uh, the relationship at, at this moment? Well, thank you, thank you, Julia. As you said, uh, we have the, the geography uh, leaves um, no no real choice uh, and uh, makes uh, our position quite clear. When and also the, the position of Russia, uh, but uh, um, when uh, when uh, our president uh, in summer two thousand nineteen. Uh, relaunched uh, the, our dialogue with Russia. It, it was a, a, a clear-sighted decision. And uh, the way we have reacted together with Germany and with the EU, for instance, to the poisoning of uh, Navalny is uh, clearly uh, a reminder that we uh, envisage this uh, uh, dialogue uh, we have established uh on on the basis of our own positions and uh as far as we are concerned of course and uh we um um we we will not uh um uh, we will not make compromises on, on our on those uh, 
positions, especially when it comes to our security and the security of our allies. And uh, the, 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 the mention of Navalny is, is also the mention of using uh, in an unacceptable way and completely illegal way, considering international law, uh, chemical, uh, chemical weapons. So uh, I, uh, I think we, we have no choice indeed, but we, we must be very, very, very active uh, on these two uh, branches of, the, uh, of the, our relations with Russia. Now, as you said, we have expressed all of us concerns about uh, the recent developments. You know that with Germany, France uh, has a, a special uh, role in uh, uh, the framework of the uh, Normandy format to, to deal with, uh, uh, to, 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 to discuss with Ukraine and Russia uh, uh, on, uh, on, on the situation in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, we had uh, last year a ceasefire, which uh, was uh, um, quite uh, um, positive uh, because it was a, a real ceasefire, which was a difference to other periods. Uh, I have myself been engaged in this when I was a diplomatic advisor to, to, to my president, of course, before coming to, to, to Washington. Now, as you said, we, we and more and more, and recently, uh, we, we've seen uh, worrying developments, and, uh, of course, um, we take it seriously and uh, we, uh, we want absolutely to contribute to avoid any, any kind of uh, escalation, which would be uh, very, very dangerous. Um, so, um, uh, in a nutshell, all those issues, of course, are issues we, we, we discuss with the new US administration. Uh, because uh, here again, uh, like in, the, in with China, we have many, many um, common challenges. Even if again we we, we are not always uh, in in the same uh, position, because uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's a reality. But we we here again we 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 share many many uh, common challenges, and um, uh, some of them are. Have already been been mentioned, and human rights uh, is one of them. But also uh, the security of uh, of Europe and, uh, and, and of, of our continent is uh, obviously very important. Thank you very much, Ambassador Haber. If I can turn to you, um, Ambassador Etienne just mentioned it. That sort of concerns about the, the worsening um, of of the situation. Now, what can Europe and America do, and what needs to happen in case the situation further escalates from where we are today? Let's have a look at the uh, um, Russian strategic objectives uh, with regard to both Europe and the transatlantic relationship. The Russian strategic objective is undermining our unity, uh, pitting us against each other, and uh, thereby uh, um, uh, undermining our capacity uh, to prevail in political um, uh, confrontations or political disputes, right? So if that's the case, uh, I think it holds a lesson for how we deal uh, with uh, differences. You've pointed that out uh, with regard to the um, transatlantic relationship, uh, and Philippe mentioned uh, uh, mentioned um, uh, geography, but you'll see that in the within the European Union too. Uh, look at Poland, uh, uh, with its uh, history and experience uh, with a very dangerous neighbor, and look on, on the east. I'm not talking about the about history uh, further uh, further back, uh, uh, and look at a country like Cyprus, Cyprus which will always factor in uh, uh, its status, interests, and the Security Council. But this, these differences, these different vantage points that come from experience, interests, uh, um, history, uh, and so forth, uh, have not prevented us uh, from taking a very strong uh, uh, sanctions uh, with uh, regard to Russia when uh, um, massive violations uh, of international law uh, um, um, uh, um, demanded it uh, on catch on uh, Crimea, uh, Eastern Ukraine, you name it. So my plea to all of us is uh, um, uh, look for the com look for common ground 
and speak with one uh, speak one language, which will mean for us uh, that we will have to manage uh, uh, or uh, overcome differences uh, where they are certainly not allow uh, them to be uh, uh, instrumentalized. And one final word: I know time is uh, really pressing. Uh, um, sanctions are an important are uh, the most important part of, or the strongest part of a diplomatic language. And they're necessary if uh, uh, massive violations of international law occur, but they can't be the only one. And their, um, uh, their uh, relevance and their efficiency depend on uh, dosage, because otherwise uh, um, um, uh, Russia or other targets will find ways of uh, circumventions. Actually, I have heard Russians brag about the fact that the sanctions targeted uh, against Russia actually um, gave them more latitude and, if you will, um, impunity. Though there were punitive measures, uh, um, they developed capacities uh, that made them uh, less vulnerable uh, uh, to international uh, pressure. So dosage of san uh, sanctions will be necessary. And a last point, uh, uh, the atrophy of international ac uh, interaction that sometimes is being called for, for very valid uh, moral, ethical and political reasons, uh, do not does not really add uh, to security. It can end up in what Kissinger once uh, called uh, diplomatic doomsday uh, machinery, and which is precisely why uh, in recent days, uh, France and Germany and the United States on all levels, uh, there've been calls uh, uh, to Ukraine, to Russia, making very clear uh, what the present uh, 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 what the present situation might lead to uh, uh, if uh, if uh, the troop movements uh, carry on. Our focus is on um, uh, de-escalating uh, this situation and making sure that we're not on a downhill road uh, uh, to more violence. That's in the uh, that's in the focus uh, right now. And again, with regard to Russia, uh, um, it will always be a complex uh, a strategy. Uh, but if we um, don't forget about what is most important in this context, and that is uh, our capacity to actually find unified uh, and coherent positions, uh, uh, that will be uh, the language that Russia, uh, Russia uh, will probably uh, uh, react to. Thank you so much. If I can just um, briefly react to that, also picking up on some questions for you received from the audience, um, speaking of a, of a unified um, response, both in the Weimar Triangle and, and the transatlantic. How does Germany assess its position on, on, on Nord Stream 2? Um, is that a stumbling block to, to Weimar unity and also transatlantic unity? I think it's not. Uh, um, I know we've, uh, it has been a, a dispute for many, many years. Uh, my government has tried to allay some of the concerns, legitimate concerns uh, with regard to Nord Stream. Uh, uh, think of the reverse flow, uh, think of the uh, EU uh, energy uh, directive, uh, think about the trilateral uh, um, uh, transit agreement uh, with the Ukraine, which Germany has pushed for. I uh, recognize that the concerns uh, uh, continue, as my chancellor has said uh, at uh, one stage, uh, um, just looking at one pipeline probably gets the entire picture not quite right, uh, because the observation is in place uh, that uh, um, uh, the United States is uh, importing probably as much uh, uh, crude oil from uh, Russia uh, as Germany imports uh, gas. So is one fossil fuel bad and one fossil fuel uh, uh, good? Uh, my plea here is, uh, um, that's the hour of diplomacy. Uh, uh, the differences that exist over Nord Stream, which come with a long history and legacy, need to be overcome. And we need to uh, uh, try to find ways uh, to mitigate uh, or allay uh, uh, both concerns uh, and uh, be able to present uh, a unified, uh, a unified uh, uh, picture to, uh, uh, to Russia on that. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we're already out of time. I have one concluding question to, to all of you in, in wrapping up. But before uh, doing so, Ambassador Vilcek, would you like to react to, to any of that uh, on the positions on Russia and what Ambassador? Yes. I mean, first of all, as far as Nord Stream 2 is concerned, uh, the Polish position is well known. It remains unchanged. And Poland perceives the Nord Stream 2 project as a threat to national security of the region. 
threat to European energy security. Uh, it's visibly marked with geopolitics, uh, with aims to strengthen the position of Russia as a major gas, gas supplier to Europe. So, so our position hasn't changed, and and uh, we, um, you know, are very concerned that that the project is continued. As far as as Ukraine is concerned, Russia versus Ukraine and Belarus. I just you know, would like to remind everyone that there is a very difficult and challenging situation in Belarus as well, obviously because of Russian influence in that country. And, um, and uh, so, so this is one thing. As far as Ukraine is concerned, uh, I just want to mention that uh, my foreign minister paid a working visit to Kiev yesterday and just a short quotation from his statement. The purpose of my visit was to reaffirm our policy that Ukraine is not alone in defending its sovereignty, territorial integrity and inviolability of its borders, and that Ukraine has every reason to defend itself. So I think we should understand who is the aggressor there. And when we speak about de-escalating or we ask both sides to de-escalate, uh, I think it's only one side which is escalating and and it's obvious that it's Russia. So uh, I think that uh, you know, Poland is very, not only very deeply concerned as everyone, but uh, Poland thinks that also together with, with Germany and France, uh, Philippe mentioned the, the Normandy format, but there are other ways to, to, to continue diplomatic dialogue on the situation in Ukraine and take action and really support Ukraine, which is occupied and as I said, we know the aggressor. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, we're out of time. Before we all <laughs> go back, um, first of all, thanks thanks to all of you. I think we've seen over this hour, which has really flown by both a lot of common ground, certainly a lot of common commitment to, to work together, both amongst the three of you, uh, as well as across the Atlantic. We've also seen there are still um, some differences to, to manage and, uh, uh, as many of you have noted, sort of different vantage points. And um, so also there the opportunity to use this format to, uh, to talk about the, the more tricky and difficult issues um, that, that will hopefully lead to a stronger transatlantic alliance as well. Before I let you uh, go, I, I'd like to uh, finish with, with uh, a sort of concluding questions to all of you and, and feel free to respond briefly and, and work in any any other concluding remarks you may have and that is something that uh, ambassador Tian you you mentioned but was was sort of echoing um what we've also heard from the u.s side you spoke of a, a foreign policy that sort of needs to deliver and, and you even mentioned you know the middle classes which of course has echoes of sort of what we've heard from the americans about a foreign policy for the middle classes so in in wrapping up it would be great from all of you to sort of have one policy area, one uh, concrete deliverable where you say this is something that transatlantic relations will deliver to our citizens to uh, achieving European interests and, um, and make, make lives for, for citizens on both sides of the Atlantic better. Maybe we start in the order that we, we uh, started with. So Ambassador Vilcek, if I, I can come back to you. So if you ask, Asked me to mention one thing. I would mention cyber, cyber security and cooperation in this sphere, because cooperation in cyber sphere is advanced and fruitful already between Poland, France, and Germany, and uh, Europe and the United States share general view on the source of cyber threats. We uh, use similar tools and took take similar actions. So I think that. A very concrete uh, example of possible future cooperation between the Weimar countries who already work together on this and the United States is cybersecurity and cyber threats. And uh, just we need more co coordination, for example, in uh, considering cyber threat intelligence. So I think that this is a, a very positive and very important. Uh, project which which can be pursued together by these three countries and um, in cooperation with the United States, of course, uh, in the framework of, of NATO and EU. But our experience uh, in this kind of cooperation is is very promising. 
Ambassador Hava. Cooperation in uh, cooperation, correlation and alignment uh, in the field of technology, which I already said uh, is the main arena of great uh, power competition of, uh, of our day uh, and is incredibly uh, existentially important uh, for uh, the future of democracies. Thank you so much, Ambassador Etienne. Thank you. I, I would quote um, um, two things because we didn't discuss them. One is linked to what Piotr and uh, Emily said, which is the agenda of uh, regulating uh, technologies and digital, digital technologies, especially tax, which is really important. And the second thing is climate, climate and the energy and uh, climate transition, where I see a good deal of uh, convergence now with the summit organized by the US on the 22nd of April and where the EU and the US can lead together, uh, including engaging China, by the way, and, and others. Uh, this is uh, something which, uh, which would be important for all of us. Uh, and our younger generations know this very well. Thank you again. Well, Jen thanks to all of you. Um, merci. To all of you, I think it's wonderful that we can uh, finish not only on a positive, but also on a concrete note um, in this relationship, which is complex and broad. And so thanks again for, for being here. Thanks to our audience um, for the questions that they've, they've posed and for being with us today. And uh, as I said, we look forward to, to doing more in this format as well at GMF uh, in, in the future. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.